Okay, let's try this again. Um, welcome to PHS 101, the introduction to physical science. Uh, I am John A. Strong. I will be the instructor for uh, this summer session. I normally teach the evening version of this class during the school year. <clears throat> so I've done it a, a few times before, so we'll hope that everything will go smoothly. Um, I emphasize my middle initial because uh, some of you may or may not be aware, there are actually two John Strongs in NTRIP. <laughs> Small world. Uh, and so we, we do have different middle initials, though. So uh, we both now emphasize our middle initials. I am John A. Strong. He is John D. Strong. Not that you need to know that, but I am John A. Strong. <clears throat> My email is jo.strong at niagaracc.suny.edu. Uh, I got this weird jo.strong because the other John Strong was here first, so he got J Strong, and I got this. If you're looking for me, be sure that you send the email to this address. Uh, we do tend to get each other's emails quite often, and we forward things pretty quickly once we notice it, but it's summer, so it may take a while uh, for him to notice if you send an email to him. So uh, if, if you want a quick reply, be sure you're sending it to me. Under course materials in the syllabus, uh, this syllabus, by the way, is also posted on Blackboard Learn uh, for this course. And um, so you can actually access all of this and you can read everything just uh, you know, for yourself. You can print out your own version and everything uh, from Blackboard. <clears throat> but just to um, uh, give you a heads up about what's, uh, what we need and what's going to happen this semester, um, We'll look at the course materials next. Um, the book that we use is called Physical Science, and it's by a guy named Bill Tillery. The book is currently in the 12th edition, but actually uh, the 11th edition went out of print just a couple years ago. And as you can see here, this is actually the version that I use personally for the class. The advantage to this version is it's cheaper, a lot cheaper, and also it's bound. The uh, current version, the 12th edition, is a loose leaf, which does save some money, but it means you have to find a binder to put all those pages in. <coughs> um, the bookstore at NTRIP bundles the textbook with an online resource called Connect, which is it, it's an online resource where you can do testing and quizzes and homeworks, and there are all kinds of other resources too, like tutorials and things like that. I'm not planning on assigning anything from Connect uh, this semester. You may want to consider uh, buying it, though, uh, just uh, for the access to the tutorials and the other resources. It may very well be worth the money, <clears throat> uh, but I'm not going to require it. The thing is, the bookstore uh, charges you automatically for both Connect and the book. So if you don't want Connect, you have to opt out of it on the bookstore's uh, website or on the class website. And the instructions are here in the um, uh, syllabus. Uh, also, you have to opt out if you don't want to buy the text from the bookstore. <clears throat> and the thing is that um, as this course is set up, we don't actually use the textbook at all until the third week of, class, of the class. So you have plenty of time if you want to opt out, you have plenty of time to buy the textbook someplace else. Uh, you could probably find a copy of the 11th or now even the 12th edition on Amazon or eBay for you know 10 bucks or less. And with a price like that, you could even pay for overnight shipping and you'd still save a lot of money compared to what the bookstore would charge. So uh, you might wanna consider that anyway. <clears throat> also, you need to be able to read Adobe uh, PDFs because just about everything I send out or anything I post on Blackboard will be in the form of PDFs. And you also need a scientific calculator. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be anything fancy like a graphing calculator or anything like that. Um, you can get a cheap $10 version from Walmart. This, this one might have been $12, I don't know, but not much more than that. Uh, and uh, as long as it can do logarithms and powers of 10, then that's good enough. If your phone, for that matter, can do logarithms and powers of 10, then you could use your phone. But it does need to be do, able to do those two things. <clears throat> the course 
um, as the official description says here, is divided into three parts. The first part is actually a review of uh, mathematical skills that are necessary for understanding and studying basic physics and chemistry. Um, don't worry, that really is just algebra. Uh, nothing too complicated. We don't get into uh, calculus or anything like that in this course. So uh, algebra, re algebra review will be the first couple of weeks, and then we'll have an exam. And then we go on to the physics part of the course, <clears throat> where we will uh, study some basic physics. Physics is a very broad subject, so unfortunately we won't be able to cover all of it, but we'll be able to cover things like um, linear motion, uh, Newton's laws, um, energy, and uh, waves, like electromagnetic waves. And then we'll have an exam on the physics portion, and then we'll move on to chemistry for the rest of this uh, uh, session. And we'll study things like the structure of the atom, and the periodic table, and naming of compounds, and um, types of chemical reactions, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, OK. Um, some of the student learning outcomes, things that um, you're going to be expected to learn in the class, it would be things like um, uh, basic calculation skills in science, like uh, significant figures or um, scientific notation, metric, the metric system. You should, uh, you know, will we'll be expected to use and be able to um, do uh, unit conversions in the metric system. Uh, metri uh, unit conversions in general, um, not only within the metric system, but between metric and English units, like inches, <clears throat> will be uh, very useful. Uh, even within the metric system, you want to be able to do unit conversions because there are certain equations that require measurements to be in certain units, but those units are not always units that are convenient to do those measurements in. So you will often do the measurement in one unit and then rely on your mathematical skills to convert that measurement into the other unit that you need for the equation. <clears throat> um, uh, proportionalities, we may or may not get the graphs. Uh, we're going to study linear motion in the physics uh, section, including Newton's laws of motion and um, applying them. Also, forms of energy, potential energy and kinetic energy and also thermal energy and chemical energy and um, things like that. Uh, also, the concept of conservation of energy. That is, the total amount of energy in the universe stays the same, but energy can be converted from one form into another and transferred from one place to another. <clears throat> um, we'll study waves, uh, include, not only including um, electromagnetic waves, like radio waves or light or x-rays, but also mechanical waves like, uh, say, ocean waves or uh, sound waves that travel through the air um, as pressure waves. <clears throat> and they have a surprising amount of stuff in common, so we'll look at things like frequency and wavelength and energy relationships uh, for those. And we'll also uh, eventually get the chemistry. In chemistry, like I said, we'll study the structure of the atom, including protons, neutrons, and electrons, uh, the periodic table, and why it's set up the way it is. <clears throat> Sorry. Molecules and compounds and naming of compounds, um, chemical reactions, types of reactions, predicting products, balancing of equations, uh, which has to do with the fact that um, when you do a chemical reaction, you have to have the same number of atoms of the same elements coming out as you had going in. Just writing the chemical formulas for the reactants and the products in a reaction doesn't always get you to that position. Sometimes you need more than one of one of the reactants or products, or maybe more than one of all of them. And so deciding on how many of each reactant and product you need in order to make sure that you have the same number of atoms of the same elements coming out as you have going in is what balancing equations is all about. And also, we'll talk about moles, not the burrowing rodent. Uh, mole is actually a word that's derived from the German word for molecular weight, and it refers to a quantity that is very useful in chemistry. It's useful because it relates 
things on the um, atomic level to things that are big enough for us to see and appreciate. <clears throat> um, okay, this uh, obviously is an online course. Uh, it is a full out college course. You'll have to do the same things for uh, this course as you would if we were still meeting in person. And um, the way the course is um, going to be set up is that um, most of the course is going to be run through Black, uh, Blackboard Learn, which is an online um, setting in which you can post documents or videos uh, for um, students. And students can actually submit work like homework or quizzes back to me on Blackboard also. <clears throat> the um, class normally meets for two hours a day, four days a week during the summer session because it is a four credit class. And um, the way the class is going to be set up online will be somewhat similar to that. Um, the class is asynchronous, meaning that the class does not meet at any specific time. But what my plan is, is to make videos of the lectures. And the lectures will last about two hours each in order to cover the amount of material we need to cover. Uh, and I will post them according to the date on which they would have been delivered if we were still meeting in person. Now, each of those two hour lectures will probably be um, divided up into four parts because one two hour video would be a really huge file and it would be really hard to handle. Uh, so it'll, it'll be basically be two hour uh, lectures in each of them in four parts. <clears throat> um, since the class is asynchronous, I will often post the videos before the date of the class in which they would have been delivered. And I will make them available to the students immediately so you can watch them as soon as you like. You don't have to watch them on the date on which the lecture would have been delivered. You can watch it before then or after then, but a big thing is do not fall behind in this class. <clears throat> it's hard enough to catch up when you fall behind in a class during the regular school year, but it's going to be practically impossible if you fall behind during the summer class. So like I said, do not fall behind. Um, okay, so you can watch the video and um, I will also post uh, homework assignments and tests and quizzes on Blackboard and then you can um, look at the assignment and do it and submit it back to me again and then it'll be graded and that's how we're going to run the course. <clears throat> be sure that you are keeping up, whoops, uh, up with things because there are ways that we have of doing online course attendance. We can tell what you've looked like and what you haven't, or what you've looked at and what you haven't. We can tell how long you looked at it. So, um, you know, we can tell if you're watching those videos or not. Well, we can tell that you let the entire video run. Um, obviously, we can't really guarantee that you are paying attention, just as we can't guarantee that you're paying attention if you come to class and sit there. <clears throat> but um, anyway, uh, you do need to keep up with the material. Um, the grade breakdown is given in this table here, which um, if I didn't need a new Torter cartridge, you would be able to see. But actually, the version that's on Blackboard is all there, so you don't have to worry about You can print out your own copy, and hopefully it'll all be there. Or you can look at it online, and it'll definitely all be there. Uh, homework makes up 20% of the grade. The way homework is going to uh, work is that <coughs> I will post the homework assignment when we begin a given chapter. And I will tell you essentially what questions to answer. And um, I will tell you at least approximately when it will be due. Uh, essentially, the homework will be due a couple of days after we finish that particular chapter. Since I've never taught this class online before, I don't know exactly how long it's going to take us to cover each chapter. So the exact date remains to be seen. The best way to do the homework though, both from a time management perspective and from the point of view of learning the material, is to work on the homework a little bit at a time every day. <clears throat> so you, know, you watch the lecture video, 
then you go look at the homework and see what, okay, what the, which of these questions did we cover today? The homework questions generally are in chronological order, the same order that they're covered in the book. And I generally go by the order of, of things in the book also. So um, you should be able to do a few additional pro uh, problems every day. And if you're doing it that way, not only does it stick with you better, but um, by the time we finish the chapter, you'll just have a couple more problems to do and then you can hand the homework in. So you won't need a long time after we finish the chapter if you're keeping up with it. <clears throat> you can, um, I, I will post quizzes on, uh, um, on Blackboard also. The schedule that's posted on Blackboard contains the dates that the quizzes and exams will be posted, but it doesn't say when they're due. Uh, I will tell you the due date when I post them for sure, but in general, the quizzes, you'll have a couple of days to do the quizzes. For the exams, you'll have probably four or five days to do those. <clears throat> and um, But I will announce the posting of any new quizzes or tests with an email, as well as obviously announcing it on Blackboard. <clears throat> and uh, when I announce it that it's been posted, I'll tell you when it's due. Quizzes are worth 20% of the grade, and exams are worth 50% of the grade. The exams are basically a long quiz. Uh, homework will be graded for effort rather than accuracy. That's what it says in the whiteout area here. <clears throat> because homework is all about practice. <clears throat> um, so as long as you do the homework, that's the important thing. You can actually get every answer wrong in the, in the homework assignment and still get full credit just because you actually did it. So just be sure that you do the homework. If you put any effort at all into it, you should be able to get the full 20%. Quizzes, though, will be graded for accuracy. <clears throat> so uh, getting the right answer, that's for tests and quizzes. For the uh, tests and quizzes, though, um, there will be partial credit possible for most parts. Uh, the exams are uh, probably going to be partly multiple choice, so you can't really give partial credit for those parts. But for the parts where you have to show your work and work out the problems, there will be partial credit um, available. <clears throat> and um, some of the tests and quizzes may involve extra credit uh, questions. Uh, late work will be accepted, but it will incur a point penalty. The point penalty will be, will be pretty small for homework. It'll be bigger for quizzes and exams. <clears throat> so be sure that you're getting those, the quizzes and exams in on time especially. Uh, the way that you can submit homework, quizzes, and exams, well, there are actually a couple of different ways you can do that. I, uh, for the homework assignments, I'm going to be telling you which questions in the book to do, and uh, then what you'll need to do is write out the, uh, you know, work out the problems on a separate sheet, and then you can submit them to me. Um, in this case, it, it's convenient doing this online because no matter what you do to submit it, you will still have a copy of it. And so we don't have to worry about making copies uh, of things before you hand them in. For the quizzes and exams, I will be posting the quizzes and exams on Blackboard uh, as if we were still taking the quizzes and exams in person. So there will be space on the sheet for you to work out the problems there if you want to. So you could, if you have access to a printer, you can print out the quiz or the exam and work out the answers right there on that sheet and submit that. If you don't have access to a printer, you could still write out the answers to the quizzes and exams uh, on a separate sheet and then just be sure that you're labeling everything clearly so I can tell what's what, and then submit it. The way that you can submit it, well, there are a couple ways you can do that too. You can submit it through Blackboard, or you could submit it uh, through my email. And in fact, of the two, I think I would prefer the latter. Just send it to me as an attachment in the email. <clears throat> um, as for what you're sending, it could be a photograph of the completed assignment. Uh, you would need to take you know, a photograph of each page if there's more than one page. Or you could scan it if you have access to a scanner. 
and send that as an attachment to an email or send it through Blackboard. Uh, just be sure whether you do a scan or a photograph, be sure that it's legible. You know, uh, look at it, make sure you can read it. Because if I can't read it, I can't give you credit for it. Yeah, so be sure it's legible. Uh, one extra thing this class has that an in-person class wouldn't would be, yeah, well, most in-person classes wouldn't, would be a requirement for a discussion. That's 10% of the grade. And the criteria for the discussion are laid out down here below. There is a discussion required for each of the three modules. So math review and physics and chemistry. And um, the instructions are given in Blackboard. So what you're essentially being asked to do, each of you, is put out there for discussion um, a couple of things that you found especially surprising or helpful or memorable from the lectures. And also at least one thing that you found really hard to understand. And you can put that out there and your fellow students can discuss things back and forth. And each student should be putting stuff out there and each student should also be discussing other students stuff with them. <clears throat> and um, I will chime in from time to time just to see what's going on and, and what's going on. If you have a question um, about the material, your fellow students may very well be able to help you resolve it. They very well, ha you know, might very well have, um, you know, memory tricks or studying techniques that I haven't thought of. So it could be useful to discuss things with them. Uh, if you have a specific question that you need an answer to right away, though, you might want to send it to me in an email, and so I can get back to you right away. The um, excellent. Um, the discussion rubric is just sort of a set of descriptions of um, replies and how much credit they would be worth, or you know, examples of, of, of replies or characteristics of replies. <clears throat> um, so you can read that down and just make sure that your responses or your posts correspond to the top box and you'll be getting all of the possible credit. Now remember, that's 100% of 10% or 90% of 10% that you're getting, not, uh, not 100 points. Okay. The final grade scale will be arranged according to percentage of total possible points that you get. And it's the same grade scale that's used for just about every class here at NTRIP. Down below here, we see um, what's expected of you, course expectations. And it's just a reminder that this is, you know, uh, a lot of online courses are blow-offs. This one is not. This is a real college course, and you're going to have to do just as much work in this course as you would if you were taking it in person. You just have to don't have to do it at any particular time of day. <clears throat> um, so there's going to be a lot of time required if you're not going to fall behind. And like I said, do not allow yourself to fall behind. Uh, this is more student-centered in that it requires even more initiative on the student's part than a regular in-person college course does. So be sure that you're keeping up with things and that you're checking things out. You should definitely be checking in to Blackboard at least a couple times a day. And you should be checking also your T-Wolves email a couple times a day. And um, you know that will help uh, keep, up, keep you up to date. It would be a very good idea to print out the course schedule. That's this thing uh, from Blackboard and keep a copy of it right by your computer so you have a, a ready handy um, reference to glance at for what's due and when. Uh, the, the course materials, of course, are available 24-7, but that doesn't mean that I'll be available 24-7, so do keep that in mind. Um, when writing anything, whether it's uh, answers on a test or posts in the online discussion, be sure to use proper grammar and spelling and capitalization. This is not a text message to your friends. This is, you know, a formal document being submitted for credit in, in a college class. So be sure that your writing reflects that as much as possible. And um, a lot of people turn into real jerks when they go online. So do try not to uh, 
do that. Uh, that's what the Netiquette part is about. Um, uh, if you've ever read comment sections on any number of things online, you know that there's something about being online that can turn some people into real, I'll say jerks. <clears throat> so don't let that happen to you. Uh, for me, I will be diligent. I'll check my emails and Blackboard very often. I'll respond to questions right away, but again, that doesn't mean that I'm going to be responding 24 seven. Uh, and it's also very important to have an alternative plan regarding technology. Uh, you don't have to necessarily tell me what it is, but you definitely do need to have uh, an alternative in case your computer dies or in case your internet goes out. You know, if a tree blows over in a thunderstorm <clears throat> like we had this morning, then what are you going to do for an internet connection? With um, the computer, well, you know, you can often use your phone for a lot of stuff. It might be inconvenient, but you can, you know, probably use your phone until um, your computer is fixed or until you can get access to another com computer. For internet access, you know, you could try a friend's house or a relative's house. <clears throat> and TRIP has Wi Fi. And even though you can't go into the buildings, the Wi Fi does reach the parking lots. So you could drive down TRIP and sit in your car with your laptop and use the Wi Fi there. Um, or, you know, most public libraries have Wi-Fi that reaches the parking lots, too. Uh, Wegmans uh, supermarkets have Wi-Fi that reaches the parking lots, so you might be able to get in on that uh, if, if you want to, or if you need to. Uh, and most of, uh, there is a number for the SUNY Help Desk. That would be a good resource for any technical problems, that is, computer-related problems. They are available not only during the day, but also most nights and weekends. So that would be a good uh, resource to have. There is a phone number under there. Um, somebody's printer needs a new toner cartridge, though, so you can't read it. But it will be there and the version that's on Blackboard. So um, you can give them a call if you need to. If you have any questions about the material, that is physics or chemistry or math related questions, then you can come to me uh, through an email. And I'll get back to you right away. Also, uh, don't be afraid to ask any questions that you might have, simply because if you have a question about something, there are probably other people in the class that have that same question. If it's something that I haven't made clear enough, then I will be sure to announce that to the class so that everybody knows. And so you can probably help your fellow students by asking a question for yourself. So don't, like I said, don't be afraid to ask. Okay, I think that that's what I had to do for the introduction. Um, we're not actually at the 30 minute mark yet, so I'm going to use the rest of this video for uh, lecture, uh, but I'm going to need to get some stuff together. So I'm gonna pause it and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, we're back. Um, and as you can see, I've done a little work while we were uh, on pause. Uh, anyway, this is the beginning of the um, a chapter on, uh, <clears throat> sorry, this is the beginning of the uh, physical science lecture uh, for this, for the course. And um, we're going to start kind of at the beginning with something very basic like, um, what is physical science? <clears throat> so I might as well start, you know, with the most fundamental points. Physical science is actually a very broad area, and it studies everything non-living anyway, going from the smallest subatomic particles to the entire universe. In fact, actually physics involves just that. Um, branches of physical science would include things like physics and chemistry and geology, study of the earth and, and rocks, uh, astronomy, study of the stars, sometimes considered a branch of physics, but not always. Meteorology, the study of the weather, and other stuff like that. Uh, the word science actually comes from the Greek word that means to know. And in practice, science can be thought of as a search for knowledge about uh, various things. There are different kinds of sciences. You have um, social sciences, which um, search for knowledge about human interactions. You know, social sciences like sociology and psychology, and you have political science, which um, 
you know, is that tries to understand political relationships between people and their governments, and life sciences, which endeavors to understand about the um, development and um, actions of living things. And then, of course, we have physical science, which is essentially about non-living things. So things like the atom or um, various chemical substances or the earth, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Science uh, in history goes back in one form or another into ancient times. Uh, really, if you define it broadly enough, uh, you could probably say that science goes back to prehistoric times even, um, simply because the way that people find stuff out is, uh, even as children, is basically just a simplified version of the scientific method. Um, but um, scientists that we can today consider to be, you know, scientists, go back mostly to, say, ancient Greece. Um, not much, not much um, before that. <clears throat> uh, a lot of, uh, of the early philosophers in ancient Greece were considered also to be scientists by modern standards because they did engage in science to the extent they were able to with the technology they had at the time. <clears throat> um, you know, and remember in ancient Greece, they didn't have fancy instruments. They didn't even have magnifying glasses at the time. Uh, most of their scientific investigations centered around thinking about things. Um, so the use of reason to determine what things are and why things happen. And that uh, unfortunately only takes you so far without a combination with actual experimentation which the Greeks didn't do all that much of. And one of the downsides is, uh, for example, there was a raging debate in ancient Greece over whether atoms exist or not. <clears throat> there was a debate about whether uh, um, materials or substances were exactly the same at the smallest levels at the, as they are at larger levels that we can see and touch, or are um, materials actually made up of tiny little separate particles that are just too small for us to see, and we can we, and we don't notice that they're separate little particles because they're so small and they're so close together. Uh, unfortunately, the former school of thought that atoms don't exist <clears throat> was um, propounded mostly by a couple of guys named Plato and Aristotle, and the uh, for uh, and the latter point of view that atoms do exist was held by some guy named Democritus. And you're saying, demo who? Um, yeah, exactly. When you're in a philosophical argument with Plato and Aristotle, you're probably not going to win. <clears throat> and so Aristotle and Plato's ideas held the, the day, um, basically held sway in science for the next 2,000 years. It really wasn't until the Renaissance in, say, the 1500s that people really started questioning the wisdom of the ancient Greeks. They began studying it and they began noticing that, hey, that's not right. Uh, and so that was probably about 2000 years after Aristotle's time. <clears throat> um, uh, so around the time of Galileo uh, and Newton, uh, that's when science first started becoming really serious. And over the years, they developed a scientific method that um, sort of is, um, helps guide the scientific process to basically um, correct conclusions. And so the scientific method is really just a series of steps for developing scientific, I'm going to abbreviate scientific there, for abbreviating, uh, for, sorry, bringing about uh, scientific ideas
and the advantage to the scientific method is that using it tends to lead you to predictable, measurable, and reproducible results. <clears throat> All of these are actually important in science. If you, um, the mark, <clears throat> sorry, of a good theory or um, scientific law is that it's able to predict things that haven't happened yet or things that haven't been investigated yet. If something is not measurable, then it's not really testable in science. And testing something is a very important part of science because how can you prove or disprove something without testing? <clears throat> it's also important that results of experiments be reproducible just to be sure that you got it right. Because if you get one result the first time you do the experiment, and a different result the second time you do the same experiment, that's not reproducible. And that means that whatever conclusions you drew from the first experiment are probably wrong. Okay, so you, you want the results to be reproducible. You want them to happen again and again and again if you try the same thing. There are steps in the scientific method. And one of them would be the first one is make an observation. Okay, that's the first step. But then what do you do with the observation? Well, you form a hypothesis with it. <clears throat> okay, your hypothesis will be It's sort of a, a glorified uh, educated guess. That is, you're trying to explain why something happens. Okay, so it's, it's like a statement of cause and effect. <clears throat> the three, uh, the third step, the third step would be See if your hypothesis is correct by trying to make a prediction about a, say, similar situation that you haven't investigated yet. This is known as testing the hypothesis. And to test the hypothesis, you would uh, devise an experiment. An experiment is a recreation of an event or occurrence. And you want to recreate that event or occurrence in a controlled environment where you can control the various factors that might affect the results. If you're investigating a situation in nature, then the experiment will often be simplified compared to the real life example because there are a lot of uh, like, you know, uh, factors that are likely irrelevant that you can cut out and um, you know th that simplifies things a lot. <clears throat> there are also controlled experiments uh, really uh, any experiment scientifically is going to be done in a controlled environment but some of them are actually called controlled experiments um, 
in which um, this is an experiment in which you would control all of the relevant factors for the experiment. And you hold all of those um, factors constant from one experiment to another, changing only one of them. And if you change just one of the variables and the results change, then you can be reasonably sure that the result changed because of that variable. Okay. <clears throat> so I see it's getting uh, probably a little over our time limit now. So I'm going to stop this video now. This is going to be part A of this lecture, and we'll continue with part B in just a moment. So I'll see you then.